Hi, welcome to episode 8 of the book of Revelation. And having completed the first chapter, we now move into chapter 2 and chapter 3 at the same time. And that may be surprising when you see on the screen verse 4 of chapter 1, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. But that's where we're going to start because we heard right away that the purpose of this whole text and this whole experience is to communicate to the seven churches in Asia. It's repeated several times at the very beginning to highlight that. So we see that here in verse uh, 4 in chapter 1. And then we saw here in verse 11, write in a book and send it to the seven churches. And then we see it at the end of the chapter as well. Um, now write what you've seen and send it to the seven churches. Um, who are the seven lampstands, and then we'll get to the individual ones specifically. So uh, the book of Revelation could not be more clear that it was not written to us or to people wherever, whenever, or of all time. It was written very specifically to the communities of Jesus' followers in these places right here. Um, these are not mythical places. Uh, these are in the Roman province of Asia, as John says here. And we might note um, the uses of Asia in the New Testament are only in Acts and in Paul, um, we see starting the beginning of Acts here, where people from Asia were gathered for the Pentecost experience. Um, Paul um, makes it to Ephesus, of course, and that's a big chapter in uh, Acts 19. Um, but he also, in his letters, speaks about uh, people in Asia. So we see at the very end of 1 Corinthians, the churches of Asia send greetings, Aquila and Prissa, Prissa, together with the church in their house. And there are some connections between Aquila and Prissa, Prissa and Alexandria, yeah, which is, of course, not in Asia, but in Egypt, which Paul never went to. Um, but uh, the point being that there's communication back and forth amongst these churches. So notice the churches here are referred to as a group, just as in Revelation they are seen as a group. We don't know if Paul is referring in 1 Corinthians 16, 19 to the exact same seven. He doesn't specify, but there's clearly communication. Um, and, of course, in 2 Corinthians, which just happens to fit the screen here, um, note that um, he's using this letter to Corinth to talk about to, this, to the saints, the holy ones throughout all of Achaia, which would be uh, something like Greece today, not exactly the same. So he recognizes that these, these messages, Paul's messages, as well as John's message, are written to particular people in particular places, um, but that they are not in isolation. Um, that these churches together comprise the body of Christ, as Paul understands it, and that they're responsible for each other and they're in it together. Um, they are, in the terms of John's Gospel, um, uh, many resting places or abiding places in God's uh, house. And rather than hear those as they've often been taken as heavenly hotel suites where you go and you die, we can understand them as these places, uh, these places of refuge and support throughout the Roman Empire where Jesus' followers could find uh, Christ's presence and be supported and strengthened as they continue their discipleship. Um, so he's writing to these people here. Yeah, and it's important that when we see it um, here in uh, chapter 2, that he's writing to the angel of each of the churches separately. Uh, and yet they all hear each other. So we need to pay close attention to the details of those churches uh, and what they're about. But first we need to see the, the structure of the entire unit here. So that's what we're going to do in this session. Um, so I have here on this table each of the seven cities and just something about them. We'll get into more detail as we look at each message. Uh, each one has a titles for Jesus, almost all which echo what we've seen already. So we already saw the seven stars, the first and the last, the dead and lived, sharp two-edged sword. We've already seen all those. We have not seen the Holy One, the True One, the Key of David, um, and we've not seen these, but we did see uh, these so far. Uh, we'll see the pattern of what Jesus knows. So in the Spirit, Jesus can see what's happening within these churches, um, both collectively and individually. And, of course, that also refutes uh, what many of us have inherited as Christianity as an individual message about my soul. Um, but that's completely foreign to the New Testament, all the texts, Gospels, Paul, and Revelation, which is directed to the churches as the replacement of Israel, as a community of people who were designated by God to be witnesses to the way of God in the world, so that all would join. And so although John of Patmos never expresses that kind of specific theology as Paul does in texts like Galatians, or Ro especially in Romans, where he talks about the relationship between the Jewish community and the quote-unquote Gentile community as being in Christ, and we end up with phrases like in Galatians 3.28, in Christ Jesus there is no Greek or Jew. Um, but here... The issue isn't Greek or Jew. The issue is uh, all these churches uh, together, 
being mutually responsible before the, the judgment seat of Christ uh, for their life together as witnesses. So we'll see what Jesus knows, both the good things and the bad things about them. We'll see in each one who an opponent is, often in the same kind of coded language we've seen already and that we'll see throughout Revelation. Presumably these references to Nicolaitans or to Balaam and Nicholas or to Jezebel, biblical characters here, um, that those symbols were understood by their audiences that are a little more obscure to us, of course, now, and sometimes completely indecipherable because we don't know who a particular person was uh, in those communities by name or even by behavior. But we can infer some things, and we will as we go through it. There's a certain threat against the opponents, and there's a reward, reward for those conquering. So each of the communities is evaluated in the presence of each of the others. Um, they're all being told uh, what Jesus' judgment is on each other. Um, and that's not so, of course, that they can gloat and go, we're better than you, or be ashamed that we're worse than you, but so they can support each other. Now, this is not judgment of a threat of hell. Uh, this is uh, encouragement like a good coach or a good parent who's uh, rightfully pointing out what needs to change and also praising what's already good, informing the discipleship character of these churches. Um, so the, it's all together. So uh, hearing it as the seven letters uh, is a complete error and very misleading. Uh, there's only one document here. And the entire text is a letter, even though after chapter 2 and 3 it's going to become uh, apocalyptic imagery as John is uh, said to come up into heaven and write what he sees and hears there. Um, so, um, important also to recognize what they have in common. Each of these little communities is little. Um, 20, 30, 40 people maybe, maybe a few more, but probably not a lot more than that. They meet in people's homes and in this late first century period. Uh, joining a Jesus community is a radical act. Um, some of that radicality will emerge, as we'll see throughout the book of Revelation, um, but for no other reason that the Roman Empire was very suspicious of new things. And to the extent that these people were expressing a new way of being in the world, or as Paul puts it, um, as it's expressed to Paul uh, when he's in Ephesus, uh, these people are proclaiming a way of salvation that's unlawful for us uh, to follow. Um, that would be a very difficult thing to take up to know that you're doing something that would be seen as subversive by the government and very suspicious by your neighbors. So in this late first century period, these churches were small, struggling little groups um, trying to figure out what it really meant to live out their baptism in the in the enormity of the Roman Empire. And a Roman Empire that was very prosperous and very successful in this late first century, which showed no signs of the cracks that would not really emerge seriously until the middle of the third century and finally until the late fourth, early fifth century, when the empire was divided into east and west and Rome stopped being the primary center of the empire. Um, but that was not known to these people receiving this uh, message in the late first century. As far as they could visibly see, the Roman Empire was strong and getting stronger, and they were tiny little communities. So these messages to the Ecclesiae are pep talks. Uh, and it's important that, as I'm noting here on this table, to call them Ecclesiae instead of churches. Um, we all carry numerous associations of the word churches, a building, an institution, a historical entity that's done various things throughout the Western uh, historical period. Um, so I want to focus throughout on them as ecclesiae, from the Greek meaning called out, here plural, ecclesia, singular, called out. Called out, originally the term was uh, referring, was used by the um, uh, Greeks in Athens to refer to the assembly of Athens, the Demo democratic assembly that, of course, in the politics of Aristotle, he describes the ideals of that. But an assembly of the elite uh, called to represent the rest of the people um, who, in Aristotle's view, were there to be farmers and merchants and, and craftspeople so that the elite could do the governing. And that's a view not very different than people like Alexander Hamilton in forming the United States, which, of course, was not founded as a Christian nation, but as a Greco-Roman one, but that's a a theme for a whole other program that we're not going to do here. Um, but relevant for reading the book of Revelation is that these ecclesiae, of course, were not like the Greek assembly in Athens. They were not the elite. They were just ordinary people, some of whom had some wealth and power, as we'll see
see as we go through this, but many of whom were struggling just to stay alive and hope that perhaps forming more, be, being one of these newly formed communities might give them some support they otherwise didn't have. Um, so it's important to recognize these are tiny little groups. Um, my wife Sue and I lead a group that meets in our living room and during the pandemic met on Zoom or outside in our carport um, of 20 or so people. And we've been meeting for 17 years and perhaps our group is, uh, is closer in some ways to who's being addressed here in Revelation than what you might think of when you sit in pews in a big building um, within a formal institutional setting, Catholic, Lutheran, or some other variation on that. Um, there's, at this point, there's no uh, order you know, in the sense that there are not um, leaders that have the authority to make decisions, and John doesn't refer to any. Paul certainly understands that there are uh, episkopoi, um, later translated as bishops, but what literally means as overseers, um, like supervisor from the Latin, you know, people whose responsibility was not to be the bosses or the directors, but to be responsible to have um, the view of the big picture. So while others are offering prophecies or doing other discipleship activities, somebody's job is to see how the pieces are fitting together. And Paul certainly knows about episkopoi, um, but they're not the bosses. And John here never refers to these ecclesiae having any official structure like that. So they're just a group of people at this early stage. Um, there's little likelihood there's any kind of formal creed. There's no formal organization. There's probably um, some traditions, because Paul knows of them um, decades before these messages were written, such as the Lord's Supper, um, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11. It was passed on to him before he passed it on to them, before he wrote the letter to them, roughly in the early 50s of the Common Era, so 40 years or so before the book of Revelation was written. So he had that earlier than that, uh, late 30s, early 40s, already tradition of at the um, at the Passover meal, Jesus identified his body and blood with the bread and wine of the Passover supper, and that that was a, a regular practice. Um, there may well have been other regular practices, um, but we know very little about that. So this is a not very organized, probably very scared and confused set of small communities trying to figure out what it means to be faithful amidst the Roman Empire. Perhaps you're part of a similar community of a small group of people trying to figure out how to be faithful in the 21st century uh, world that we're in now. So in our next session, we're going to look uh, at the the message to Ephesus. And Ephesus is the, um, the only one here that Paul also wrote to, um, but the others will also give, have a lot, we have a lot of data about the others from many sources. Um, uh, there's a whole book written on each of these places in the ancient world, and I'm not going to repeat the whole book here the, for each city. I'm just going to make a few points that help us understand the, the message there. So stay tuned. In next session, we will begin to look at chapter 2 to the message of the, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. See you then.